Birds of Upper Newport Bay, a virtual training field trip, fall and winter. This is the second video of the three of this virtual field trip. We're going to, in part two, discuss the group's gulls and terns, rails and coots, and then a big group called shorebirds. Part one, and I want everyone really to go through part one first because it tells you the logistics of this field trip and why uh, it was set up. It's really important for you to understand that. In any case, part one has logistics, grebes, pelicans, cormorants, herons and biddens, and waterfowl. And part three, which is the final video, the last video, is on raptors, doves, hummingbirds, kingfishes, flycatchers, crows and ravens, gnatcatchers, and other land birds. This is another JDW Talks. My targeted audience are Newport Bay Conservancy Naturalist Training Class. I tell you about that in video one the Upper Newport Bay docents who have gone through that class, and the birding and wildlife public. There is a, a small pocket website there. You can find out more about me. This was recorded in October of 2020. So let's look at continuing by looking at groups and emphasizing groups and the species within each group. And we're going to look at two main gull species. They're in the dark. The ones that are in lighter um, uh, color uh, are expected at Upper Newport Bay. Hammond's gulls are more of a coastal species during, during the winter time. And we should see California gulls. But the ones that are in dark on all these uh, group um, slides are going to be the ones we emphasize. And you should know that there are at least uh, 20, at last count, species of gulls in Orange County that have been recorded. Two of them were state records, never seen before in the state. And you can look at this list and you'll find out that there's no species of gull called a seagull. Every gull has its own species name. One of the problems with identifying gulls, especially for beginners, is that they change plumage uh, over uh, be between whether they are juveniles or second, third year animals or four year animals in some cases. And so this is the Western gull. It shows you all of the plumage changes. It reads actually right to left here. And it's one of the things that that gull watchers have to learn. They just have to learn this. Um, I was at a, um, a field trip that led it with uh, uh, an elementary school. I asked him, what's the difference between those brown birds and those black and white birds? And one kid wrote, said, well, the ones that are brown are sunburned. However, I thought that was cute. But what was not cute was someone told me they were on a field trip and the naturalist said, that the ones that are black are females or, or the ones that are brownish are females and the ones that are black and white are males. And that is absolutely wrong, absolutely wrong. So here we are at the uh, Science Center and there are some large gulls, two gulls on top of the roof. And these happen to be Western gulls, Western gulls. And as we go through a species, we'll do a, uh, a text summary. Uh, I'm not going to go through all of these things. You could always pause the video. And as I show you, there's no species of gull called a seagull. Uh, I mean, should the gulls that nest in San Francisco Bay be called bagels? Is that, does that make sense? Western gulls are a four-year gull to reach maturity. And they breed on islands uh, off the uh, coast of California, like the Farallones and the Channel Islands. They could also interbreed with other large gull species. 
So there are some gulls that just cannot be identified because of that. You may see them dropping uh, a shell uh, on the road. That's a learned trait. They're trying to break the shell to get into uh, the um, uh, food that's inside. There's another gull species that we uh, might be able to see. I have distant views of it. You can see there's lots of life here. Uh, on the upper part, it looks like uh, there are some ducks on the left, probably green-winged teal. There might be a blue-winged teal on the right. There's a coot there. Uh, there's a tern, which we'll talk about in a little while. But there are these other uh, gulls here. They're much smaller than the westerns. We look at it. We see that the bill has a mark on the bill. I'll show you this in much more detail in a second. It's actually named for uh, the coloration of the bill. And that's called a ring-billed gull. It's a three-year gull. It takes three years for it to become an adult. Um, it's called the fast food restaurant because it's found around uh, fast food restaurants, schoolyards, etc. And it has a stiff plover-like walk. I say it looks like a bird is in a girdle. And it's the least pelagic of our wintering gulls. So let me show you let me show you a close-up of a ring bill gull. This was taken in Dana Point. You can see the marking on the bill. There is a close relative that sometimes people overlook. It's a much more uncommon bird. Um, and uh, I don't think it's that bird, is, the other one, has been seen in up in Newport Bay. That's called a mew. And if we take a look at where these birds actually breed, if they don't breed a lot. Most gulls do not breed at the coast. Instead, the ring bill gull uh, goes all the way up into Canada or on the plains. And the mew gull uh, breeds on, in tundra, goes all the way up to Alaska and northern Canada. Terns are not gulls. Terns are uh, a very different uh, physical uh, look to them. They have pointed wings. They're very agile. And there are a number of potential tern species that are at Upper Newport Bay. The least tern is an endangered species. We won't see it in the fall and winter because it's down south. It's migrated out. And there are other species here uh, in, in light um, uh, color that I'm not going to talk about. Uh, they might be found in, uh, and they should be found uh, during the summertime at Upper Newport Bay. Um, we're going to look at basically three of them, Black Skimmer, Caspian Tern, and Forster's Tern. Forster's Tern is a year-round bird uh, resident uh, in Upper Newport Bay. You'll sometimes see it on posts or on channel markers. During the fall and winter, its head is white on the top, but it's a full black cap during the breeding season has a black bill. And here is a summary of Forster's terns. Uh, they're more agile than gulls. They have pointed wings. Uh, they hover over uh, the surface of water and then they dive into the water for small fish. They eat other uh, invertebrates, amphibians, etc. Now, uh, there is a really nice uh, tern species, and I'm going to show you a video uh, that I took in October. It was high tide, so that a lot of the shorebirds and other birds were coming to the highest uh, uh, land that was around. And that's not unusual. In fact, uh, a good habitat would always, in a marshland like up in Newport Bay, have these high land areas that birds can go to during high tide. In fact, there are eight species of birds that were at that point that day. We took a, we'll look at some other photos of them uh, as we go along. But here we have a bird that's very, very distinctive. Uh, black back, uh, uh, kind of an orange, uh, orangey at the base of the bill, uh, orange feet. There is a juvenile in the front as well. And if you notice, 
uh, and there's also a juvenile on the top, uh, you notice the size of the bill, that the two parts of the bill are different lengths, especially in the adults, especially in the adults. And the lower part of the bill is much longer than the upper part. These are black skimmers, black skimmers. And when the young first hatch out, both mandibles are the same length, but the lower one grows faster than the upper one. And the way they hunt is that they um, uh, fly over the water with the lower mandible cutting the water surface. It's really a spectacular sight. And when they hit a fish, uh, they can grab the fish with a sideways head swing. Their nickname is Cutwater because of that. Uh, the, and they mainly feed at uh, uh, dawn, dusk, and uh, evening hours. Uh, they may not be able to compete with the other tern species, and they develop this very unusual life um, uh, pattern. I think their eye also has a vertical pupil, uh, which might adjust it, uh, adapt it to night vision. Neat bird. In fact, in October, when I got home and I took some, a bunch of still photos as well, I found that one of the black skimmers was banded. And occasionally you will see a banded bird at uh, Upper Newport Bay. You can report the birds to the banding, uh, U.S. banding service. Uh, but, you know, I looked at this, I blew it up. Um, I uh, tried to uh, um, increase the, uh, um, the focus on it, and then I posted it to Orange County Birding. And I said, you know, uh, advise, is it really worth it to pursue this uh, further? Because I couldn't read very much, although you can just kind of make out maybe some letters on the right, on the right band. Looks like it's a little bit blue. And lo and behold, the very next day, I got an email uh, on Orange County Birding from Kate Goodenough, who said that my group in San Diego has been working on a skimmer project since 2015 to study movements of the California population of black skimmers. And this is one of her birds. And she was able to clean the band up enough to see it was M7. And it was banded as a chick at the salt works in San Diego in 2018. So that's not that's pretty good considering how far away we were uh, when I, we zoomed in and uh, uh, she was able to get some scientific information. So if you see a banded bird, note which foot the band is on, which foot any of the uh, colored bands are on, and any other th situations. And uh, there are ways of of uh, submitting that information. Uh, and it, it, may, it may be very useful, even something like, like this, that I thought just because I couldn't read very much, uh, it would really be useless information. Keep your eyes open. That was so much fun. Let's do it again on an un incoming very high tide. That would be on October 18th, 2020. Lots more birds on this spit. I wonder if our banded bird is one of the skimmer flock. Oh, that's a nice picture. It shows how thin the front part of the bill is of those two look like juvenile skimmers. So let's see what oh look there's a one of the one of the skimmers has a band. Uh, let me blow that up. That's, that's not the band that we had on October 7th. Uh, the, the combination, color combination, uh, is different on the, that right foot. There's not, nothing written. I better email Kate, and I did that on October 18th, same day I, I discovered that, uh, on the photos when I actually looked at them at home. And she responded, I know this individual. It was banded as a chick by myself in July 2019 at the San Diego Bay National Wildlife Refuge. 
The youngsters, and this is interesting ecology, the youngsters often roam back and forth from Santa Barbara to San Diego over the winter. I expect that this next summer we see her, I guess she knows the sex of the of this individual, we see her back to San Diego to see if she will recruit to the San Diego breeding colony. Thanks for the recite, uh, both of these now, and the photos. I will add them to my database. Kind of neat, adding a little bit to science. Um, however, I need to go back to October 7th on that spit because actually there was another bird there uh, that I wanted you to see. So we are on uh, turns and and uh, uh, here is a look at the uh, point where all these birds were. Does anybody see another turn species? Take a look. Is there another turn species here? One good turn deserves another species here. And of course, that should stand out for you. One of the things I'm trying to do is to increase your observational skills. Let's look at that closer. Has a pointed bill, black on the tip, kind of a, what, a reddish color uh, uh, on it. During the breeding season, that head, that cap would be pretty much black. And I wasn't actually going to include this uh, in the talk. I didn't expect to see this Caspian turn here, and there might have been royals as well that come into the bay at this time of the year. But I've included it because there it was in October of 2020. And the Caspian turn, that blackish bill tip, is a field mark, but it's not always obvious. And the juveniles may stay with the adults for up to seven months begging for food. They may be as big or bigger than the adults. It's, it's quite a sight. Same thing true with rural terns, which have more of an orangey bill, uh, but they are large terns as well. Our next group are coots and rails. American coots are related to rails. It's easy to see coots at Upper Newport Bay. It's not as easy to see the rails. And there are some people who have gone out a number of times, uh, enjoy Upper Newport Bay, might have heard rails, but have never seen them. Well, we're going to see them. And the way to see them is to go out during a very high tide. This you're looking at is not a very high tide. Uh, we're above the boardwalk on September 12th, 2019. I'm going to show you a panoramic view from there. We start it going. Look, it looks like, like green felt. This is just uh, near the Muth Center. You can just see that, that on the bottom right is where the boardwalk um, wall is, if you're familiar with this. There are lots of activity of people there, horses, bike riders, hikers, etc. We're above that. We're above that. So the trick is to come out here on a very, very high tide. This probably... At this time, I think I looked it up, it was three feet uh, uh, above uh, median sea level, I guess is the way they set it up. So I'm going to come out here on October 18th, 2020. There is a 6.5 foot high tide. That's pretty high. And uh, about, I don't know, I think it was about 11 a.m. Uh, at this area. You can clearly see the uh, beneath us is the um, uh, hiking area, bike path, uh, etc. I might actually be uh, a little bit to the west of where I took that panoramic. Instead of showing you a panoramic, uh, obviously it looks much different. I'm going to show you three slides from this position. And we're not even at the top of the uh, high tide influx in this area here. And we go a little bit more to the right. And if we went farther to the right, we probably would see the Muth Center, if we could see it from this point in that hill. So that's what we want to go out and take a look and see whether we can find any rails. 
Doesn't look like there's much high ground here. So this isn't, I took this actually before the, the peak of high tide. Um, where are the, where are the rails? Where are the rails? Well, I happen to have a super zoom camera. That's really pretty good. So let's zoom in and I'll show you where the rails are. I start the video. And you can start to see, and this, and this is in a still picture, you can see there's movement here of these birds. There's actually two species of rail. There's one on the bottom left, just left the screen, and there are two in the upper right. So let's take a, a, um, uh, a photo uh, of that scene. And because the sun is directly in front of me, Everything was backlighted. They were kind of in silhouette. So I tried to, uh, to, to some extent, overexpose the JPEG I took. And here you see on the, on the left-hand side, looks like a chicken, little chicken. That is a Sora rail, S-O-R-A. And there may be as many as three, maybe four, of those small rails in this picture. The problem is, and it's actually gotten better, that during the high tide, all of the refuse that comes into the bay is then seen because it tends to float up. So it's not it's not a great scene. Uh, and you can see there's a can there and some other trash as well. But it used to be a lot worse than this, especially with plastic bags. And then we have the larger rails, which are the Ridgeway rails. And there may be as many as four of them. Uh, in this one photograph. This was taken on Christmas bird count in 2019, another high tide. Uh, the sun was in a better position uh, that I could take these photos. And in this case, you're seeing um, probably three adults and maybe a juvenile Ridgeway rail. Ridgeway rails used to be called clapper rails and I have this in my collection I'm not sure when it was taken they had signs up at Upper Newport Bay on Back Bay Drive on clapper rail crossing but people kept stealing them so that ended that uh, experiment so here we have Richway's rail it's an endangered species it's the voice of the marsh Based upon DNA in 2014, they decided it was not a clapper rail, but a species on its own. And so that's the reason why uh, there's a name change of it. And you hear expressions like thin as a rail. Well, that might be referred to the fact that rails are compressed laterally to walk through reeds. These are most vocal at night, dawn and dusk. They have a distinctive call. That's why they are the voice of the marsh. A related species is this one, and this is a American coot. It is a migratory bird. So on the golf courses in Dana Point that I bird around, uh, populations build up during the winter time uh, of these birds. And here is a view. I'm not sure what date it was. I'm pretty sure it was from up in Newport Bay. I tried to have all the photos from up in Newport Bay for this field trip there. Uh, but if I have a better photo uh, from San Joaquin Marsh Wildlife Sanctuary, Marsh nearby, or Dana Point, I'll use that instead. So an American coot, um, it's, it's not a duck. Uh, it's related to the rails. Its nickname is mud hen. It's an egg dumber. It lays its eggs, and dumps them in other birds' nests on there. And uh, interesting bird. Uh, if it comes out of the water, you'll see that its feet uh, look like snowshoes, some of the toes, in order to walk uh, on the marsh vegetation. 
So we're going to look now at shorebirds. Shorebirds are a very large group of birds at Upper Newport Bay. Um, it helps if you develop some observational skills uh, to see the differences between uh, the different species. And the ability to see them depends a lot on tides. And this is from Audubon Magazine uh, about how to take shorebird photos. And they point out on the incoming tide, uh, around three hours before the high tide, the rising water starts to move the birds off the flats, the mud flats where they're feeding, and up toward the shore and the higher positions. During the high tide, uh, most of the birds are sleeping in the high areas around Upper Newport Bay. And then in the outgoing tide, uh, you'd have to wait until the mud flats are exposed. So about two hours after high tide, the birds are on the move uh, going to these feeding areas. So you should see a tide table if you're going to go out uh, to look at shorebirds. Because if you go out in high tide, their heads are going to be buried in their plumage. They'll be sleeping. There's an excellent um, free government publication for educators on exploring the world of shorebirds. There are lesson plans there, uh, and uh, it's really a neat little, little resource that you might want to get. I have a link there uh, to, for you to write down to get it. And they indicate that there are a number of different families of shorebirds. There are avocets and stilts. Oyster catches are mostly uh, coastal rocky uh, point areas. We're not going to see oyster catches at Upper Newport Bay. It would be uh, really unusual. And plovers are then a group called sandpipers. There are 37 species of sandpipers. Nine species of plover, two species of avocets and stilts. So let's go through these families. There are two species here in the stilts and avocets. I'm going to talk mainly about the American avocet. Black neck stilts are in our area. Uh, they tend to be uh, um, prefer freshwater habitats. And so at San Joaquin, Wildlife Sanctuary, which is a freshwater habitat, it's only about five or ten minutes away from up in Newport Bay, you will see on a regular basis black neck stilts. Uh, that's not the case in up in Newport Bay. And you may see American avocets, again, much more common to see them, uh, but their populations are never very, very, never very, very high. So here I am on the Christmas bird count. It's probably in December. And there's a, a group of uh, avocets here. They're in winter plumage. Um, they have an upturned bill. You can see the one on the right has that upturned bill situation. And I'll show you on um, uh, a 2017 in uh, silhouette uh, the uh, avocets are very long-legged, and they bend down, they sweep their bill uh, if there's water to gain uh, their food. And some summary about avocets. Uh, one interesting thing is if there are a bunch of them, they may feed uh, like a military parade all together doing the same thing. And there are some ways of them feeding uh, add up in Newport Bay. But just to show you what the other group does look like, black neck stilt, this was taken in Dana Point. Um, I have also photographs from San Joaquin Wildlife Sanctuary. Its nickname is Daddy Longlegs, and you can see why. It looks very delicate, has to really reach down to get food. Neat bird. The next group are plovers. And I put four species on the group list here. Um, snowy plovers, I don't expect to find during the, the fall and winter months in Upper Newport Bay. Uh, but the other three 
uh, you have a good chance of seeing black belly plover, killdeer, and semi-palmated plover. Snowy plovers are a threatened species. And that teacher guide tells you that plovers are compact birds with relatively short legs. That's most of the species, not two that I'm going to show you. They use their short, fairly thick bills to pick prey from the surface of the sand or mud. But the thing is this, you know you're looking at a plover for the way they feed. They feed as a step, step, stop pattern. I'm going to show you this. It is very, very distinctive. We're going to take a movie of this plover. It's the kill deer. And you can see there are lots of insects moving. But the killdeer is not moving. It's frozen. Up oh, there it goes. Come on. Up, oh, run, run, stop. Look. Run, run, stop, look. Look at that. That foot is in the middle of the air. Isn't that great? That's a typical blover walk. Killdeer. They're named for their call. Kill deer, kill deer, uh, have interesting behaviors. There are two black breast stripes, as you can see, that defines the species. They have what's called a broken wing act. If they have a nest nearby, uh, it looks like you, you suddenly you see this kill deer. It looks like it's hurt. It's dragging its wing. And as you go toward it, it moves away. It's moving you away from its nest. So, is this another plover? Run, stop, look. That's a black belly plover. Now, you say to me, I don't see any black belly. There's no black belly there. Well, these are winter plumaged birds. In fact, you can see on the bottom left that one of those birds has that dark cap. That's probably a remnant of its summer plumage. And so you have to be careful uh, when you're birding up in Newport Bay because the shorebirds we see are probably going to be in fall and winter plumages. You know, the expression, uh, birds of a feather flock together, uh, certainly seem to fit this species. This is actually the same point that those black skimmers are. Uh, so if we went farther back, we would see that. That big yellow foot on the upper right, you should know what that is from. That's actually prob probably from a snowy egret. We talked about those in the first video. Now, we see these birds during the winter time. Where do they go during the breeding season? Well, black belly plovers, and this is from Merlin, uh, the app, go all the way up uh, into uh, northern Alaska and Canada to breed. And you can imagine what global warming is going to do to breeding populations in North America of this species. There's real concern about conservation of our shorebirds. Real concern. So here is a summary of black belly plovers. Um, they commonly feed at night. Uh, run, stop, look. Uh, and again, uh, during high tides, we're going to see them uh, at elevated positions in the uh, upper Newport Bay. So here we have a black-bellied plover. Anybody have any questions now? Why, why don't you have questions? One of the things I'm trying to do is to get your observational skills up. You should have some questions. John Burroughs said in his essay on the art of observation, which I often use in my uh, teaching, that people who discourse pleasantly and accurately about the birds and flowers 
and external nature generally are not invariably good observers. In their walks, do they see anything they did not come out to see? Is there any spontaneous or unpremeditated scene? Do they make discoveries? Any bird or creature may be hunted down, any nest discovered, if you lay siege to it. But to find what you are not looking for, to catch the shy winks and gestures on every side, to see all the byplay going on around you, missing no significant note or movement, penetrating every screen with your eye beams, that is to be an observer. Let me tell you about this picture. So on Thursday night, I went out to Upper Newport Bay at dusk before the Thursday night um, uh, naturalist trainees uh, session on birds. I stopped at the Overlook on Back Bay Drive uh, on by the silt where the silt berm used to be. I looked out and I saw this thing in the mud. And I said to myself, what is that thing? And I didn't have my camera with me. I did have my smartphone and a spotting scope. So I started actually to take pictures through the spotting scope. And as people went by and said what I was looking at, I said, what do you think this is? And someone said, well, that's a basket. That's some sort of garbage. And I looked and looked at it. And when I got back to the Muse Center and looked at the photos and blew them up on my smartphone, I said, you know, I have a feeling I know what that is. I have a feeling I know what that is. Dick Newell was there that evening. He took a crew of um, the people who work at Upper Newport Bay, the fish and uh, and game people, uh, some others. It was really muddy, and they retrieved this thing. And it turns out that what you're looking at is a skeleton of a sea turtle all the way up uh, and up in Newport Bay. I found this picture online. Uh, This woman was putting together the bones of a sea turtle, and you can see uh, what I have here. So this was a big sea turtle. You can see the person's foot there. So observe, question, speculate. Now, here is another plover. Uh, has short legs, has a single breast band, has the general posture of a plover. And if we had um, uh, video of that, it would be a run, stop, look pattern. And this, this little guy is a semi palmated plover. It has a single breast band. It shows that uh, run, stop, look pattern. It even has some other behaviors like uh, shivering its feet, patting the ground to stir up prey. It's not a snowy plover, which is the threatened species. Snowies have a sand colored back, not brownish, and snowies have an incomplete breast ring. And I've seen snowies only once on our fall training field trips at Upper Newport Bay. So let's look at the major group, and the major group are called sandpipers. Now, the confusing thing about this is that some of the species have sandpiper in their name, but others do not, yet they're all considered sandpipers. Okay, so keep that in mind. Um, I put, and we're going to look at uh, a number of these, two, four, six, seven, eight, basically eight. I'm lumping the two Dowager species together. Now, you're going to have to use your observational skills here. So this is uh, actually at the outlet of uh, Big Canyon. Uh, They used to congregate there. Uh, This is 2017. In recent years, I haven't seen this number here. There are better places to see congregations like this. There are three species here. Can you find them? Take a look. Can you find the three species? One of the species is this brown. 
And if you look um, at the front, to the left of the bird that's uh, uh, sitting on the sand, you'll see that it has this really long bill. Uh, and you can pick out that long bill elsewhere. It's slightly up curved. What's another species here? When well, another species is this gray looking bird, um, it has a pretty straight bill and it has long legs. And then if you look closely, you'll see that there's a third species which are intermingling with them. And you will see these, this combination of three species again and again and again at Upper Newport Bay. They tend to stick together. Again, the three species, but now we see that the gray species, when it, uh, its wings are, are extended, show white. And in fact, that is in large flocks in Upper Newport Bay, and you can look out and you can see all that flashing of white. So let's look again. Species one, upturned bill. Species two, straight bill, flashing white. Species three. That wasn't hard. So species one, look at that bill. God, what a bill. That bill goes up to God. That's the way you teach this to people that were looking at a God wit, a marbled God wit. The other birds are Dowiches, our third species. And they breed in, Calif in uh, Canada uh, in the plains. So we see these birds on the coast. We think they're coastal birds. In fact, they're inland birds in a great extent. And um, some information about Marvel Godwits there. There's even a time budget. They spend lots of time uh, preening, 17% of the time. Birds want to keep their feathers in great condition. Here is our second species, our gray species. We're at the edge of the ocean. It's doing a bunch of pecking. It can go down deep. It's going to get some sand crabs. How does it know it has a sand crab? How does it know it's not some sort of pebble? Well, it's thought that a lot of these species have sensory endings at their bill and they can detect prey species, even if the prey species are deep in the mud. You can go down pretty far, far, but not as far as some of the other species. What about this one? This is actually uh, the same species. That species, the species we're talking about is a willet, and you're looking at a breeding plumage. So you can see the difference between a breeding plumage bird here, willet, and what we've seen, um, the gray bird flashing white. Quite a difference. So be prepared for that if you're going to do shore bird looking at Upper Newport Bay during the fall and winter. And again, it doesn't breed uh, on the ocean, it doesn't breed by salt water. And let's see, I think we've covered all of this. Again, you can pause the video at any time uh, to, to look at this. And if you had gone through um, video one, uh, I went through a couple of field guides and suggested that people, when they see a group, uh, go to that group in their field guides, and I suggested some free field guides, then look at the species on the list, and then get ready to see them uh, on the actual uh, video that I'm showing you. So here we have a bunch of dowiches. Dowiches. It turns out there are two species. They were split in 1950. A long build and a short build dowager. Um, you can't go by the length of the bill, and I've decided just to um, 
combine them as a dowager species. But there are some field marks they're giving you uh, in the facts. You can tell a, a dowager and the characteristics are they're down stitches. They're like a sewing machine. And the next little video clip shows what I mean by that as to how they feed. See the up and down movement like a sewing machine. So let's test what you have, what you should have learned. Species one, Marble Godwood. Species two, Willet. Species three, Dowager. Uh, just a second, just a second. What's this thing? This is taken at high tide. Uh, I'm, I'm on the Jamboree Bridge looking down uh, at this group of uh, birds that are resting during high tide. That is a different looking bird. It has a downward bill and it has a striped head. And let's look at it in a little more detail from Dana Point. And it's in, in, in relatively dry sand. It's amazing that it's going down and it's getting sand crabs. Every once in a while, you'll see it'll pull something out and eat it. Whoop, there goes something. So this thing is a wimbrel a wimbrel and you've oh, got another one again from uh, Dana Point and again a shorebird that breeds very far north in North America and uh, in danger because of the global warming problem. And something about wimbrels, they flock, the flocks fly in lines, etc. All right, let's try that again. Now, I'm cheating a little bit. That actually is a godwit. That's a very rare godwit. That's a bartail godwit that was discovered in 2009. Hundreds of birders went out to take a look at that bird. So, what's that? Marbled Godwit. What about that? American Avocet. What about those little guys? Dowiches. But there's actually a fourth bird, fourth species in here. People see it? this guy look at that long bill and that is a long billed curlew a long bill curlew nickname is sickle bill it's our largest sandpiper with the longest bill in the world so we actually have something that in all the field guards throughout the world, when they talk about sandpipers, we have the largest species of sandpiper with the longest bill. Now there are small sandpipers, very small sandpipers, that collectively we call peep. And the way to discriminate them is by the color of their legs, by the size of their bills, there are all sorts of other patterns as well. There are five species we call peep. You notice that some of the birds that we're looking at have yellow legs. Those are least sandpipers, the smallest one, and the others are westerns. And they can get to be pretty large flocks of these. Um, if you see a flock, and that's my bottom note, take off, and then form a dense ball of birds. Look around to see if there's a peregrine falcon in the area.
because all those little peep are trying to get into the center of that ball uh, to avoid being eaten by the peregrine. And the least sandpipers are the smallest sandpiper species in the world. So at Upper Newport Bay, we have both the smallest and the largest sandpiper species in the world. Neat. I'm going to show you a video of another sandpiper. It has sandpiper in its name. It's being it's it's backlighted. The sun is uh, away from me, so the sun is directly uh, facing me, which makes it difficult to actually see the colors of this particular species. But it's definitely a spotted sandpiper by its behavior. And you will see a very unusual type of movement of this animal. And we will find out what its nickname is because of that movement. So take a look. I mean, all you have to do is you don't even have to see the colors of this animal. Uh, there is a, a bigger uh, species that's found uh, along the coast in rocky areas during migration. But this is a year-round resident. And, uh, well, take a look. Pretty neat, eh? Now, it's a spotted sandpiper because during the breeding season, it does have spots on the bird. So here it is in Dana Point. Tita Tata bird. It has a stiff wing flight, very characteristic. It's polyandrous. There's one female to multiple males, and the males tend the nests. The female just courts other males and uh, uh, leaves the eggs for them to hatch out. So this is video two, Birds of Upper Newport Bay, a virtual training field trip. And I hope you've gone through one. You still have one more to go. This is one of the JDW talks on YouTube. I have a number of virtual birding field trips, Life of the Naturalist Adolphus Seaman, Burn and burning optics uh, talks as well. Uh, my other interests are in genealogy, helping people find um, families on the U.S. Census by address, and Ellis Island and Ellis Island immigration is another one of my areas of expertise. So I hope you've enjoyed this, and I hope you will go on to look at video three.